Hello, my name is Daniel Ramirez. And my name is Eric Akins. And this is our final presentation for IoT security. Uh, our project was a pill dispenser uh, connected to an alarm clock with an MQTT protocol. Uh, this was primarily set up using Raspberry Pis. Uh, the coding language we elected to use was Java because that was the language with which we had the most experience. And that we chose for MQTT was Mosquito. Uh, we chose to compromise our system using man in the middle and denial of service attacks. Uh, for the man in the middle attack, we used a tool called EdderCap. And then for denial of service, we utilized a tool called Low Orbit Ion Cannon, or LOIC. Uh, so the applications of our device, it can be used as a pill organizer. It can also be used as a standard clock. Uh, it also reminds the user of when to take medication with an alarm. And unlike other pill dispensers with our alarms, uh, our alarm clock and pill dispenser are physically separated. Uh, this allows the user much more freedom on where they want to place their devices. Uh, this way they don't need to keep any large or cumbersome pill dispensers in inconvenient locations. Instead, they can store those dispensers within their home and to be within earshot of a normal alarm clock and once that alarm rings, they'll know it's time for them to take their medication wherever they decided to keep it. So in terms of the uh, initial planning phase of our project, uh, as you can see here on the right hand side, we have some diagrams to check out. Uh, the top one is our original diagram for our alarm clock. Uh, it consisted of three buttons, a LCD display and a speaker. Um, originally, we planned for the clock to have an alarm that the user could set using those buttons. Uh, and a speaker obviously to play that alarm. And when the timer went off and the alarm played, uh, it would send a signal to the pill dispenser and the light on that dispenser's current day would shine. And that brings us to the model of the pill dispenser, which is uh, below the clock, as you can see. It has uh, two weeks worth of med medicine containers. Uh, next to each container is an LED for that individual time. And the bottom diagram shows that underneath each one of those individual tabs to open each one of those individual containers, uh, there is a push button. And so when the user presses down on the tab, that would also click the push button and that would turn off the LED next to that container signaling that the user had removed the medication. So for our first device, we have our alarm clock and you can see it right there uh, in all of its glory. Um, the changes compared uh, made to our planning phase is that we added an additional field so that the user can set a day that the pill box can be refilled. Initially, we were only going to have the user uh, be able to set that at a certain time or that it was going to be automated for the system, but we decided to be more practical to allow the user to set a specific day that the dispenser would need to be refilled. Uh, this consists of a Raspberry Pi 4, an LCD screen, two push buttons, and a speaker. And as for the software, the main code for this section is the clock class. Uh, this class configures the hardware components and establishes the interfaces between the push buttons, the LCD, and the speaker. Uh, these are all set in the button.java class, the I2C LCD.java class, and the simple audio player.java class. Uh, the buttons are configured to be able to set the day and time on both the clock and the alarm for the pill dispenser. And once the clock's day and time become equal uh, to the day and time on the timer, the speaker will play an audio alarm and a message will be published to the MQTT broker uh, for retrieval by the pill dispenser. Uh, the message will vary depending on the day of the week. And if the day happens to be uh, the one that the user has designated as the day to refill the dispenser, a second corresponding message will also be published to the broker. And that brings us to the second of our devices, which is the pill dispenser. Uh, so the changes on this device compared to our planning phase is that uh, we only have one row of pill containers uh, instead of two. And instead of having a push button underneath each individual tab, we simply have one push button right here, as you can see. Uh, the changes here were mostly due to the difficulty of securing resources in a reasonable time frame uh, because of the quarantine conditions we were under. And uh, this was the most efficient way to adapt our design to finish within the time constraints. Uh, the hardware here consists of a Raspberry Pi 3B plus, uh, eight LEDs, one for each of the seven days, and also a refill LED right here in the corner. Uh, there's also the single push button right here, and then obviously the medication containers for every single day. 
So the main code for this device is in the button and LED class. Uh, this class will construct and connect to an MQTT broker, which will continuously listen for messages sent by the clock. Depending on the message received, the class will then turn on the corresponding LED. Uh, this LED can then be turned off by pressing the single push button on the device. Uh, the system of listening for messages and publishing responded by tokens, whose validity is verified by the message action listener class. And to configure the hardware correctly, the Listen GPIO example class establishes a GPIO controller on the Raspberry Pi and allows for the push button to be configured as a GPIO pin. And now we're just gonna look at a simple demonstration of our device. So here we have our pill dispenser, single push button, containers, and all of the LEDs. And there is our alarm clock. So we'll be moving over here to the LCD screen. And the first thing we're gonna be doing is using the very first push button to change the mode on the clock. Uh, the mode determines which of the information fields uh, the user can change for the timer. So we just change it to minutes. And now we can go over to the second push button and now increment the minutes field under the timer. It started at 45 and you're gonna see that we stop it at seven, just so we can get it to ring in just a few seconds and then we change the mode back to the standard clock mode so that no field can be changed. Oh, sorry, my mistake. First, we're gonna change the mode today so that the user can change the refill date to Thursday, which is the day we film this video as displayed in the clock. Now we change it back to clock mode and once the real-time clock reaches the timer, an alarm will sound and a message will be published to the MQTT broker. So there we have the alarm. Now the message has been published and as you can see, the lights are on. First, since we set the refill day as today, we have the refill LED light shining. And then we also have the Thursday light shining because that's the day of the day. Get the medication. Push the button and the LEDs turn off, signaling the removal of medication. And then we can go with the alarm clock and press the push button and that will disable the alarm. So that is just a demonstration of the on a refill day. Um, just for a demonstration of device when it is not a day to refill, we have this short video here. It's going to essentially run through nearly exactly what the last video did just going to change the refill date to be different than the current day. So as before, we change the mode to minutes and we increase the minutes to get it a lot closer to the real time clock. And we see here that the day is currently Thursday, so we're going to need to change that. So we change the mode to day or set mode D, and then we can use the toggle to change the refill date to Saturday. And then we can toggle the mode just back to the standard clock. So now just in a few seconds, once again, the alarm will ring and publish an MQTT message to the broker. As we can see, the light for Thursday is shining. The container we take the medication from, but the refill LED was off because of the difference in days. Now we hit the button, the LED turns off, and that was our demonstration when it was not a refill day. And so now that was essentially the functionality of our device, and I will pass it off to Eric Aiken, Vice Security. Alrighty, uh, with the IoT devices fully functional, we move on to hacking them. For the first step, we needed to get access to the MQTT packets being shared between the Raspberry Pis. Base Wireshark on Windows was giving us some issues. Through research, we found that Wireshark has a toggle mode called monitor mode. It would allow for all packets sent through a network to be captured. 
This ultimately ended up being a dead end as the network adapters on our computers did not meet the specifications to allow this mode. From there, we found a Linux tool called Ettercat. It is a program made for man in the middle attacks and would allow Wireshark to capture the packets of other systems on the network. We downloaded the latest Ubuntu version on a virtual machine and installed the program and its dependencies. Initially, the virtual machine was giving us some issues. It would not detect any of the devices connected through Wi-Fi. We surmised that the system was only picking up other systems connected through Ethernet since the internet connection on the virtual machine listed it as wired. We tinkered with the settings and forced it to only use the network adapter for the computer. Afterwards, Ettercap was able to pick up the Raspberry Pis on top of any other machine connected to the Wi-Fi. With access to the Pis and the other systems connected to Wi-Fi, we targeted the router and any other systems with ARP poisoning so we could receive whatever communication was going on between the other systems. At this point, everything was set up for Wireshark on the Ubuntu virtual machine. All we needed to do was filter it to MQTT communications and we would have access to the communications between the two IoT devices. Next slide, please. Deciphering the important bits of information in the packet was quick and easy. For a man in the middle attack, we needed the IP address of the broker, the port, and the topic to subscribe to. As well, the messages sent between the systems are not protected and were easily visible, making it easy for us to decipher key words shared between the system. With those in hand, we went back to Windows for the rest of the hacking. Now we could publish messages to the broker and we could listen in on the communications. Listener and publisher codes were made in Python. We decided to do the hacking portion in Python so we could approach the situation from scratch and from the mindset of hackers. Using the publisher code, we could light multiple LEDs on the dispenser and cause confusion in the whole process. With one of the end users of the product being older people, there is a potential for the user to misread the system and it could effectively hamper their pill schedule. Next slide, please. And here we have a video demonstrating a man in the middle attack. On the right, we have a, uh, the broker for the uh, Raspberry Pi. And on the left, we have a code that will publish messages to the broker that will turn on all the LED lights in a while loop and keep them on even if the button is pressed. So we are about to run the code. And as you can see on the right, it is continuously publishing messages and now we are about to go over to the dispenser. And as you can see, all of the lights are active. And even when you push the button, they still come back on, effectively making it impossible to tell which pill box you need to open up and take from. Next slide, please. Another avenue of attack available to us as hackers was a denial of service attack. Using the IP address found from the MQTT packets and Nmap, a network scanner available on Windows, we were able to find the open ports on the system. Using this, we found that port 22, the SSH port, was still open. During the scan, we also found that another port was open, but it was being used for the remote software so we could monitor the Raspberry Pi and see the effects of the DOS attack. We opted to only target the SSH port for fear of ruining our ability to observe the system mid-attack. We enabled SSH during the development of the devices so that we could expedite the coding process. Using the newly found port number and IP address, we used a program created for perpetuating DOS attacks, the uh, Low Orbit Ion Cannon, LOIC. Uh, the LOIC takes an IP address or URL and, and a port number and can DOS attack a system with ease. Going into this, we were uh, very unfamiliar with the system and it took us a while to figure it out. In the end, by using 12 instances of the LOIC across two laptops, we were able to stop the IoT devices from functioning. As the attacks progressed, the quality of the display for the Raspberry Pi deteriorated and dropped in resolution, as you can see in the, one of the photos to the right. Demoing this portion of the hack was difficult given the amount of time it would take for the attack to take effect on the Raspberry Pi. Instead, we opted to just show what happened to the devices when the attack was successful, which should be on the next slide.
And here, as you can see, the uh, timer on the clock has stopped and none of the lights on the LED are lit, effectively making it, effectively breaking the IoT uh, ecosystem. Next slide, please. In order to combat these threats, there are a few things we could have done. The easiest of them is coding the project to ensure that the minimal amount of data is being transferred between the two systems. We achieved this by making sure the only thing the clock can affect on the dispenser are the LEDs. As well, we made sure the dispenser had no ability to affect the functioning of the clock. Beyond minimizing the information sent through the packets, we could have secured the packets with the built-in authentication system that comes with MQTT. We could have used the username and password parameters to make sure every packet needed authentication. On top of this, we could have secured the MQTC packets with an actual layer security with transport level security, or TLS. It would have required more resources from the system, but it would have been worth it to prevent intruders from learning keywords that could interfere with the functionality of the pill dispenser. Finally, when it comes to DOS attacks, the best method for protecting against them would be to ensure all accessible ports are closed. Coming out of development, the SSH port was left open, leaving a major vulnerability for a hacker to exploit. As developers, we were lazy. We should have done security checks on the system to make sure any settings activated for ease of development were reset as soon as the product was ready to go into uh, production. Uh, I believe this is the end of our presentation. Uh, thank you for your time.